I was revisiting uh, old TV shows this week and stumbled upon uh, the, the theme song for Cheers. Anybody, anybody, the 80s show, yeah, you know, the whole, the whole, uh, where everybody knows my name, where troubles are all the same, uh, that's where I want to be, a place where troubles are all the same and everybody knows my name. There's something about that show that was magical and it really was set, like the main location was set in a fictitious Boston pub, but the show itself we were drawn to. I wonder why. I wonder if it was because Sam, Woody, Rebecca, Cliff, Norm, and Diane, they could go through things. They could be going through all kinds of things. But when they got to Cheers, it was like, hey, come on in. Come on in. Grab a drink. Let's sit here. Let's, let's talk about what's going on in life. And so I thought about that song. I thought about the show. And, and one thing I know for sure, like, to be honest with you, a fictitious Boston pub with a theme song where, every, where troubles are all the same and everybody knows my name, it sounds a lot like a church I would like to be a part of, right? Where you could just kind of, you could show up and belly up to the table and whatever's going on in your world, whatever's going on in your life, there was a place for you and everybody knew your name. We like, we need that. We're, we're hardwired that way. We're hardwired to want to be with people that want us to be there. None of us like to be with somebody when we know what's, you know, we're going to be the proverbial third wheel. You know, we know, no, 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 I don't, I'm good. I, we, we lie. You know, I got to wash the cat or something. But the reality of it is we just don't want to be the, the, the quote unquote third wheel. We don't want to be places where it seems like we'll get in the way. We want to be places where it feels like we're known. I got to thinking about this in my life and, and my wife and I, when we first moved to, to California, we were, you know, from Dayton, Ohio. And so we were un, unaware of like what it meant to live in wine country. Uh, you, you guys probably won't believe this, but I promise you it's true. But like my first drink of anything alcoholic whatsoever, I was, I think I was 25, 26 years old, something like that. Um, because it, in my household, I was raised where it was, it was, it was, it wasn't like a preference. It was right and wrong. And we didn't drink. My parents didn't drink. And I honored that. And so I had no, so wine country for me, like I had no idea what that even meant. Like it, when my first drink, like I, I remember inviting some friends over to my house. I had just had my, like a first couple of drinks. They had all been drinking. And I, and I went, I, I put some stuff in my fridge and my friends came over and I was like, Hey, uh, yo, <clears throat> I got drinks in the fridge. If you want some drinks. And, and then I went to the fridge and all it was, was Mike's hard lemonade. And they're like, yo, this does not count dude as drinks. So I got a late start. I was a late bloomer, you know? And, and so I remember we moved out here and we were just trying to figure out what it meant to live in wine country. So we were visiting some wineries and, and so we're in these different wineries and, and we we stumbled upon one by, by a recommendation and it's in Lodi and it's called the Dancing Fox Winery. Anybody hit to the Dancing Fox down in Lodi? I mean, it's the, yeah, it's an amazing spot. It's a cool restaurant. Like it's basically a delicious restaurant and the winemaker and his family are so cool. The first time we ever went there, and my wife will tell you, it was a really weird uh, kind of chance meeting. We, we, we go and we end up meeting Greg. Greg Lewis is the restaurant owner and the winemaker. And we're in the back and we're doing a wine tasting and just kind of hit it off with him in this really weird way. And he's like, do you, do you guys want to do a barrel tasting? And I didn't know what that meant. So I'm like, yeah, of course we do. You know, so, so we load up and we go to the barrel tasting and, and we're hanging out with him and he introduces us to his family. And, and so Dustin, his son, and I became good friends friends. Dustin actually came and spent the night at my wife and I's house one night hanging out playing, what was the name of the risk? The game, I hated the game, by the way. The risk, the game risk was horrible. But and then and then the, his the, his other brother Jared, Jared played in my band and storytellers for like two years. We just hit it off with his family. And we would pass a hundred restaurants leaving Elk Grove to go to downtown Lodi. Why? Because we walked in and they knew us. Isn't this something about like you walk in and like it's like, hey, what's up? And then they, they be like, you want the usual? And when they say that, it's basically like you look around like, I, I'm, I'm kind of a big deal around here. Then like, I guess there's the huge. I'll take the huge, please. And we like to be places where people stop what they're doing and they come up and they, they give us a hug. In our case, like Greg Lewis, the winemaker, like once he settled down, he'd sit at our table for 20, 30 minutes and ask about the kids. And we love to be at the Dancing Fox because when we were at the Dancing Fox, we were known. We all need that. We all want that. 
And here's my assignment. Let me just give you my assignment for today, what the Holy Spirit has asked for me to do for you and for me, as it's been done in me already. My, my assignment is very simply to ask you and me, since we know that we love to be known, does it still move us that we are known by the creator of the world? Do our spirits shudder a little bit at the idea that there is a king of kings and a lord of lords who is well acquainted with you and with me. Since we'd like to be known and since I would drive from Elk Grove with my family and, and risk the 99 going south, they, that spot when it goes from like three lanes to two lanes where the people are jumping out of planes and you end up almost rear-ending somebody and I end up losing my salvation sitting in traffic at that point because I'm cussing to people, but I digress. But we would do all of that just so we could get to Lodi because when I got there, they made us feel like we belonged there. Since we're wired that way, are, do we shudder? at the idea that I am known by the King of kings and the Lord of lords. John chapter 10 says it like this. It's, this is Jesus speaking, and he's saying, I'm the good shepherd. I know my sheep. And Jesus is finally fulfilling Psalm 23. He's the fulfillment of, of the psalmist that says, the Lord is my shepherd. And here's what Jesus is saying. You know that, that psalm that you have hanging in your bathroom? Jesus says, I'm the fulfillment of that. I know the green pastures you like to lie down in. I, I know the quiet streams that most comfort you. He says, I know the kind of valleys of shadows of death that you will need to walk through. And I'm, I'm in that with you. He says, I know those that are against you, those enemies. And I'm setting the table up right in front of them all. And it's just me and you and your strength about the enemies, but Jesus says, you don't got to be because I'm the good shepherd. And he says, I know you. Does that move you today? You know, do we, do we, do we find ourselves like, wow. I mean, since we're wired as people that love to be known, does it move us to be known by Jesus? He says in Matthew chapter 10, verse 30, he says, but even the hairs of your head are numbered. That's a greater feat for some of us than others. You know, <laughs> I got amen. I appreciate you. Uh, we got Rogaine samples on the back. Just holler one on the way out. But, but for some of us, that's a greater feat than others. But I like that Jesus said, and Jesus, it, the context of this passage of scripture is that Jesus is reminding us, don't stress. The, the context is Jesus is saying, I got you. Don't stress. But if you Think about, he said, the hairs on your head are numbered. And I got to thinking about that today. He could have used any reminders that we are known, but he said, the hairs on your head are numbered. I think it's probably because it's the single most volatile and changing thing in our bodies. I got out of the shower today, and there were hairs, and they keep coming. I mean, I'm getting nervous. I ain't going to lie to you, but they keep coming, and they're at the drain. And, and Jesus took number. He didn't miss a single one. You know you, you know, you brush your hair, and if you're like me, you brush your, first off, my, especially when the, there's all of us using a single brush, like when we had little kids, and you look at the brush, you're like, is there any hair left in my house? You know, like the brush, so there, it's, you brush your hair, and, and hairs come out, and Jesus is saying right now, he says, I didn't miss a single one. I am so well acquainted with you that even as you change and as your body shifts, Jesus says, I'm right there, which says not only has he known you, not only does he know you, he is constantly about knowing you, and that's why? Not only did you know me, like you found me, not only do I know that as I sit here, I am known, like you are constantly about the work of knowing me. Does that move? I mean, that's really my assignment today. If I boiled it down in a simple sentence, I hope that when you leave here, all of us have a little bit of wonder that was stirred in our hearts, like the posture of our heart is a little bit more in awe that we are known by God. Because we risk replacing that with knowing about God. You know, we risk ch exchanging. I know a lot about God. I know the songs of God. I know the activities of godly people. But do you know that you're known by God? David was good at this. He, he was better at this than I am most of the time. Maybe that you are. He says in Psalm, he says, I look behind me. This is Psalm 139, verse 6. I look behind me. We read this last week, but I wanted to revisit it. You're there. 
I look up ahead and you're there too. Your reassuring presence coming and going. And then David does this thing that I want to inspire us all to be a little bit better at. This is too much. This is too wonderful. I can't take it all in. Do you read David having a moment? Like he's like, give me, God, I just, you're everywhere I go. I can't get away from you. You are so faithful to me. And he says, well, I need a minute. I need a minute because this is just too good. He, David's like, I don't want to miss this. I'm going to embrace this moment. I don't want to forget this moment. And maybe David was saying, I, maybe David was saying this. I know me. Next time something comes and tempts me to be distracted or discouraged, I'm going to be like, oh, where's God in all of this? So he says, I don't want to miss this moment. I, I hope today to create a moment that you don't miss, that you lean into a little bit of how David sees this. And, and you go, this is too wonderful. This is too much for me. He was better at this than me. He says in a different place in Psalms, in Psalms chapter 8, when I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? I, I like the way the message reads the same passage, and so I'll read it to you. It's pretty poetic. He says, and through the message translation, I look up at your macro skies, dark and enormous. Look at this. Your handmade sky jewelry. Moon and stars mounted in their settings. And then I look at my micro self and wonder, why do you bother with us? Why take a second look our way? Do you see David's posture? Taking the time to not lose the fact that he is known by God. What David is reminiscing about, he knows the same hands that flung stars into the cosmos were nailed to a cross for me and for you. And David is recognizing the work of Jesus before he's even at the cross. He's recognizing just the creator, sustainer, God. And he can posture his heart to go, man, I am known by God. Enter our story. Enter us. God bankrupted heaven and he sent Jesus here to be with us. And, and so what David was reminiscing about, the same hands that flung stars into the sky and and made the sky jewelry that David's talking about. Those same hands were spread wide on the cross for me and for you. We are known by God. Does that move us today? Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah said in chapter 12, verse 3, but you, O Lord, know me and you see me. We'll just pause there. Hey, that, don't, that just seems to land with us, right? Like, you know, maybe someone has met you in, a, in a, a, an important moment and they says. I, I just want you to know I see you. And isn't that sometimes just exactly what we needed so we're not forgotten? Like sometimes somebody will say, I just want you to know I know what you're going through. Man, I see you. And, and just being seen sometimes is enough to just bring comfort to us. And, and in Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah is saying, but you, O Lord, know me and you see me. Like you can't, like right now where you're at is true, but I also want you to know those moments and those seasons where you are hiding, it's also true. He knows you and he sees you. You can't escape him. I read a story. This wasn't a, a news story. It was, it was a couple of years ago, but there's a dude by the name of Riker Webb and he lives in Montana. He's a three, was a three-year-old boy a couple of years ago, lived in Montana, was playing with the family dog. The family had some property that butted up against the woods and he got to playing with the dogs and let, next thing that you know, he he was lost. And so a huge manhunt in Montana was underway. And for three days, they were looking for this little boy. And the first night he was lost, a huge storm came. And so the family and the search parties were thinking the absolute worst. They finally found little Riker Webb. He was a couple miles away in a neighbor's house in a back shed inside of a lawnmower bag trying to keep warm. I mean, this little dude, he was probably in the worst possible place to get found, but he was doing the best he knew how to do to stay out of the elements and to stay warm. And they finally found him. Listen, with Jesus, there ain't a lawnmower bag on the planet you can crawl inside of and be missed and forgotten. You can't outrun what it means to be seen and known by the Lord. And those of us who like to try and have experienced his faithfulness say, amen. And then he says this, he says, oh, Lord, you know me, you see me. And then it says, you test my heart towards you. You test my heart towards you. I like it. Vicky said last week, and she said, Vicky said on her video, she said, I've heard that, uh, that the Lord tests you sometimes. She says, I, I'm going to lie, I felt this one. She said, I'll, I'll, get, I'll get the next one around. When you see this word test, it's like you, 
It seems like there's this pass or fail kind of grade. I think what, what Jeremiah is referring to is there will be things that will come that will poke at whether or not you know this to be true. There will be things that will enter your heart and come into your, your emotions and in your fighting, warring with your desires, warring with what you, your faith and what you know to be true. And Jer- the prophet Jeremiah is saying there will be times that this will be tested So I don't want you to forget that this is true. You are known and you are seen. Over there will come times when it will be tested. You fast forward to the book of Galatians where Paul is, I think, maybe giving us a little deeper look into what it means to be tested, that this thing that we know to be true, what happens when it comes under fire a little bit? Galatians chapter 4 verse 8 says this, before you Gentiles knew God, You are slaves to so-called gods that do not even exist. Verse 9, so now that you know God, and then he says parenthetically, or should I say now that God knows you, and you can leave that up there, but that's important because there isn't a single one of us in the room that can take credit for we just woke up one day and decided we wanted to get to God. No, none of us can get to God unless the Spirit first draws him. We are wired, or her, we are wired to run from God, to, to defy the very nature of God. We, we were created in his image, and we are constantly trying to pursue our own identities. But then sometimes, in the, whether a service like this, in the, in the midst of a crisis, in the quiet car ride, as you lay your head on a pillow, we begin to think through our own lives, and we begin to be, compare us to what the, the ways of God, his designs, and his plans. And in those moments, then now we know that God knows us, and now we get the opportunity to know God. And so Paul says this, why do you want to go back again and become slaves once more to the weak and useless Do you mind reading these words with me? Spiritual principles of this world. We'll we'll come right back to that. Verse 10 says, you are trying to earn favor with God. You are trying to earn favor with God by observing certain days or months or seasons or years. And verse 11 begins with these words, I fear for you. That for me was staggering when Paul said, I ain't going to lie to you. I'm scared for you. What Paul is saying is that you've put all your, you've banked everything and what you are doing to earn favor with God. And he says, I'm, I'm afraid for you. I am nervous for you because you don't know God. You, you just decided that you know about God. You know the exercises that appear to be godly. And Paul says, look, from my experience, I'm nervous for you. And he says the nervousness that he has is anchored in spiritual principles of this world. I spent some time meditating on that, and that language blew my mind, that he would say spiritual principles of this world. What blew my mind about it is that it's the same language that Paul, throughout other letters, uses to describe, you know, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life and jealousy and greed and fornication and all these things that he, he triggers as us pursuing this world versus pursuing the things of God. And he uses the very same language to describe spiritual principles of this world. Why does he do that? Because it's just as much a part of our flesh as it is when we have the other things. Because we're trying to satisfy this thing that we can give ourselves so that we feel better, so we look better, so we can try to earn this thing. And Paul says it's as dangerous to do that as it would be just to pursue the, your fleshly desires. It gets you just as far in a relationship with God when you just pursue spiritual principles with no relationship as it does when you pursue the other things that naturally pull us away from God. And he says, when you're eventually going to hit this thing where it's going to be tested. That's my friend AJ's story. In our series, This Is My Story, that's what, that's what happened for my friend AJ. Had, had mounted for himself a whole lot of things that he could go, I, I, I'm good, man. I, I figured this thing out. I've checked all the boxes. And then Paul, when Paul says, I fear for you, trust me when I say that my friend AJ is very aware of what happens when that system that you built comes crashing down. 
First Corinthians chapter eight, verse three, this is a powerful and, and, and important key before we go into the video. If anyone loves God, hey, you know what, let's read this together if you don't mind. Let's find a cadence and read it together. Ready? But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. Let's read that again. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. One more time, but this time put emphasis on the known, like you believe it to be true. But if anyone loves God, God, he is known by God. What is the key that unlocks this thing that I'm known by? I'm, David was like, well, I, just, I just need a moment. This is just too much to take in. And what's the key to experience that? When we realize that this is not about what I do, this is about a relationship with you. And when we say, I love you, and I need to stop replacing that love with all kinds of other things, because eventually what that's going to do is come crashing down on me. So the key to me knowing you and being known by you is simply loving you. That's the story that AJ is learning. Watch, watch this. My name's AJ, and this is my story. I was born in a Pentecostal church, raised in the Pentecostal church. My grandfather used to be a pastor, so born, you go to church from day one. So growing up in church, you know, being part of the church, playing keyboard, I was like, you know, God is great, God is wonderful. So I don't, in other words, I feel like I was the guy that had a tip on my shoulder because I was not doing what everybody else was doing. So um, I went to church, I don't curse, I wasn't drinking, I wasn't smoking, so I felt like I was a good guy, and God is on my side. I got good grades, and that's how I lived my life. I was born in Ghana, in West Africa. Lived in Canada pretty much most of my life, in Switzerland. And then I moved to the United States back in 2006 and joined the Navy. Um, to that, I also met my wife, moved to California in 2012. You know, get married here, um, have two kids. It was great, wonderful, no issues, no complaint. And then, a little bit more or less than two years ago, I got a news that I didn't want to hear you know, about some infidelity going on in my marriage. So being a Christian, the first thing I did was like I prayed and I also cried. I said, God, why me? You know, I, I checked all the marks. I did what I can. I, I was the guy, you know, <laughs> that didn't want to do bad things and didn't play around. So why this is happening to me? So the next step was basically to go to counseling you know, to see things will work out. And going through counseling, more things came up that I didn't want to hear, you know, where you have to do DNA test. That's the last thing every man wants to hear. And as a matter of fact, that broke my heart. If he start loving God, why do I have to experience pain? Because I have two kids and every time they're in danger or they're in problem, I feel it. So I do the best I can to protect them. Even if it's their own fault, I still step in and get in the way that they don't get hurt. So to me, it was like a big why. I'm not perfect, but I did the best I can. I bought the first keyboard for the church. <laughs> I played, you know, I taught my friends, teenagers in the youth group. So why, you owe me God, I, why do I have to deal with this at this point? And I think that's one of the pinnacle of my fate, because at this point, I really, really have to question what I believe and what does it mean to me. So I have to step, take a step back and look at things from a different perspective. So maybe, hey, what other religions are talking about might be the way. So I tried something else. I started looking around like conventional ways of trying to understand life. What's the meaning of like, what's the purpose? Um, psychics, um, new age, tried everything try to read other books to see, okay, am I doing the right thing? Is this the God that my parents taught me about? Like, you know, if he's so powerful and so great, why this? There's a verse in the Bible, I can't quote exactly, but I'm gonna paraphrase that. Paul said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. And I started thinking about it, like, okay, so this is Paul, you know, he met Christ. And then he's still saying this. So the question is, do I know him? And does he know me? 
And if I do, how do I know him? Do I know him because of the way I perceive him to be or the way he is? Because what I thought I knew growing up, being in the church, playing keyboard, that was not enough. Because it took one phone call that changed everything about me. I was wondering, like, if this is God that I really, I really want to know. I'm not interested in just the testimonies of other people. I want to have my own experience. I want to have my own story. I want to have, I don't want to just read about Joseph and Job and King David. I want it to be about me too. Like, this is my experience. This is what I found. So when Paul said that I may know him, I said, okay, maybe I don't. Maybe there's more to it. And maybe I have a whole perception. Maybe he does ways that I don't understand. He does his ways. And if he's that powerful and so supreme, then he should be able to answer those questions. He shouldn't be intimidated for me asking the question, God, where are you? And who are you? And can you open up to me? And it's been great. It's been a wonderful journey for me. Today, I don't have all the answers. So it's more like I'm still in the journey. But I'm more kind of hungry. And it's more of a challenge. Like, I want to know who you are. I'm not looking for a gift. I'm not looking for to have a gift of prophecy. I don't want to looking for the healer. I just want to know you. Who are you? This is the place I see people like me. When I see people like me, it's like people are real. We're not playing church. You see people coming in like not wearing a three-piece suit and trying to act holy and, you know, doing that normal traditional church thing. It's like everybody walks in there and you say hello, they mean hello. When you say hi, they really mean they want to say hi. Or they don't want to talk, they don't want to talk. This is this why. So that sense of realness is what makes me come every Sunday. Because I don't think I'm going to a church. It's more like I'm going to be with people that's trying to look for the same very fair thing I'm looking for in life. When Ed, Pastor Ed comes on, talks about his life, and you talk about your life, it's like, okay, maybe this is the place for me. This is the place for me. It's not, I'm not looking for the traditional church where you walk in and make everything. It's like, hey, okay, God is good. Yeah, we know that, but I really want to know more than just saying God is good. I want to experience them. Finding a home and a place where you feel welcome when people are genuine. And this is the place for me. This is where I can share my story. I don't have the answers, and I don't think I can answer everybody's questions or how I deal with the deal because I have no clue how I deal with it. It's more like I'm, I'll say I'm, I'm hungry and frustrated too. It's like, no, like, I want to know more. Not in the sense of like being a religious kind of activities way, like I'm doing this, I'm doing that for more. It's kind of a calm, chill, frustrated man sitting there, God, I want to know what you're really about. I get down, yes, I get sad, I get angry, but now I have a solution. I go back again, I can I pray. And I sing a hymn, I sing a song, and it works. And the next thing, like, when do you pray? How do you pray? And I said, no, I, I got away from the traditional process. It's more like he's with me. So it will be in the car, it will be at, at work, it will be at anywhere in a moment. So. I don't have a set time. It has to be 2 o'clock in the morning. I have to sit in a certain position. I have to go down my knees. No, I could be, I'd be lying down. <laughs> I could be at church and my mind would be somewhere else. I would say to the person that doesn't believe in God or just don't know where they are in life, whether this thing called church or converge or whatever you call it, it starts from within you. You know yourself a lot enough. So take that faith that you have within yourself to start with that. You know, I would just say, like, you know, just really pay attention, ask the questions, be real. Ask the right question, God, if you were real, I want to do this journey with you. And I, I'm not saying God is going to come down like an angel or like in the movies, but just be real. Take a look around you and ask yourself, like, you know, you see real people behind you, then there's the real God. Then take that real life and ask those questions, ask the hard questions and expect an answer. My name is Kwaku Sain in Ajamai, and this is my story. That, uh, that applause is for you, just to tell you thank you for sharing your story. Uh, I wanted to just tag on to the story. Uh, yes, yesterday, uh, we, we, AJ got some news, and uh, 
This is not a story that like he, he's been in the past that he's working through that he's finding as, as powerful as Vicky's story. It, it dealt with coming out of hiding from something that was 30 years ago that you just let kind of fester and get infected and just lock it away. And, and it's the invitation just to stop hiding and to come out. And AJ, his is like right now in the middle of it. Like he texted me on Thursday morning and maybe you caught it. He didn't want to make a big deal about it, especially since his children are in the hallway right across the way there. I had to tell Georgia, make sure his kids don't come make their way into this theater because this is some raw stuff that we're dealing with. And AJ's story included the need to take a DNA test. And he texted me on Thursday and he says, yo, bro, pray for me. It's that court case. So we recorded this on Monday, two weeks ago, and the man's talking about a hunger and thirst for Jesus. And I had no idea how right now that this whole thing was. He texts me on Thursday, pray for me, dude. Uh, it, the rubber's about to hit the road. Do I get to be their dad? Do, I, do they come home with me? Is my life about to get flipped on its head? So I text him Friday morning, and I'm like, I didn't hear back, and I'm not going to lie. I, you know, All I said is, just checking on you, bro. Uh, how'd it go? But what I was really saying is, scared to death that you didn't get back to me. Can you, can you do me a favor and let me know what happened? He texted me back Friday morning. Court case went so long that we couldn't come to a decision. I'm back in court today. I had to record the virtual message, like, which goes on the app yesterday, not knowing what was going to happen with AJ. And he texted me yesterday, and he told me, I, in fact, rather than me say, where, AJ, where you at? Can I have your mic, Ed? Come on down, AJ, do you mind? the news. Um, I don't like standing in front of the public. I prefer to sit back over this. <laughs> it's very comfortable. Right? Um, I've been dealing with this for about almost two years. Um, I was accused of domestic violence, something I did not do. So I went to court and the first thing they said to me is that, you know, you in the military? I said, yes. But being in the military in the past, like you get you used to people seeing you, hey, thank you for your service. But I was sitting in the courtroom, um, from Thursday and Friday, yeah. I trust you from the, while well, I was on court. Oh, wow. And all I kept hearing was like, oh, he's a dangerous person. He's in the military. He's dangerous in the military. He's, he's dangerous. They were not even talking about the incident that happened where the person that caused the incident was arrested. But they're not looking at that. They're just looking at my military record. Wow. Um, it went on and went on. I was like, like I just forgot. Seriously? Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. just did a video and now <laughs> I have to deal with this now. So eventually the judge came back and said, we have to come back. And then the judge came back on Friday and he looked at me and said, well, I've looked at both of your cases and uh, I don't think he did anything wrong. Um, you get have full custody of your kids. <laughs> and, uh, as for the other person, he, uh, I think they have to go to anger management and you guys can take off and go. With and your kids. With my kids. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. I just want to say I want to thank the church and the, the pastor too because I've been in church for a very long time. You don't get your opportunity to test your pastor while you're sitting in court because you have to go through the loops. You have to go through mm. all kinds of loops to reach your pastor. But maybe because he has an iPhone, that's why he picked up. <laughs> <laughs> Go on now, that'll preach. <laughs> but being, having the flexibility to test your pastor in court and say, hey, I need your prayers and he responded back. Lesson for us as a family, and I thank the whole church and I thank everybody in here. Um, I like coming here because there's a lot of business going on that people don't want to talk, people don't want to afraid to approach you based on color of your skin or so many things. But all of you to make a joke. Yeah. This is the only place that you can walk around, people can look at you. Hey, remind me of the guy that does the TikTok that goes. <laughs> <laughs> And it's just lovely to, to be able to be yourself and you know, crack a joke and have fun. That's yeah. what I have to say. My friend AJ, can we welcome him again? Love you, buddy. Go ahead. 
So what's the, what's the point? Well, number one, no matter what you're going through, uh, please don't lose heart. No matter what is going on in your story currently and right now, please, please, please don't lose heart because God is faithful. He, what, your circumstances don't feel like it. It looks as if all odds are stacked up against you. I just wanted you to know you are known by God. He, you are his sheep, and he says he knows you. And so he will be faithful. I just wanted to tell you that through the life of my friend AJ. And, and the most important thing I wanted to say, and this is not a popular opinion to say in, in church. It's, it's really not. But what I appreciated about my friend AJ was his real-time wrestle with his faith. And he said on video, he said, God's not intimidated by your questions. And you know what I've experienced? When I have questions about faith and my experience, those, uh, those that, that I served with or those in leadership at the church took that to mean that I was losing my faith. And they are very, very different things. And I wanted to tell you today, if you're here and you are wrestling or questioning or don't know, you are welcome to figure that out here with us. God is not intimidated by the fact that you don't know what you believe yet. God isn't freaking out because what you thought you knew, now you're unsure about. In fact, let me go a step further and say this. As a guy who has done the process of deconstruction in my own life, here's what I have learned to be true. When you realize that this thing you were given, which you were told what to think and told what to believe and told what value systems that you should have, sometimes in your adult life, you see inconsistencies and questions and you, you, you see the people that you put a lot of stock in and now they're away. You go, I don't know where any of this, I don't know where I fit in any of this, what's true and what's not. I've learned this, that sometimes, sometimes those who begin the work of deconstruction Instruction. It's not because they stop caring. It's because they care too much to not make it their own story. I didn't expect an amen for that. I wanted to say to the person in the room that is not sure what you believe, I'm not intimidated by that nor is he. And you're welcome to stick around because here's what I know to be true. He is faithful and you can't outrun him. And I would rather you be here with questions and doubts than just leave here and throw in the towel because you don't know how to raise your hand or that particular lyric in the song you're wrestling with. I'm not intimidated because I know what I know what I know and he is faithful and he's never let me down and he has been faithful to me. When I looked at him, I remember singing the song, forever God is is faithful. I'm singing the song to a couple thousand people, and I'm going, yeah, but is he? But is he? Uh, I've got some things going on in my life right now, and I'm just, I'm not sure. And he, you know what I didn't have? A, a place to go. I'm just not sure. And I could really use some uh, meeting with someone and talking through this. I didn't get that. And you know what we will be every time? That every single time. Here's Paul, Philippians chapter 3, verse 4. Though I could have confidence in my own effort. Justin, you guys come on up, brother, if you don't mind. Though I could have confidence in my own effort, if anyone could. Indeed, he goes on and he kind of doubles down. If others have reason for confidence in their own efforts, I could have even more. That's verse 4. I'll skip 5, 6, and 7. It's just Paul basically giving his resume. And he's like, when it comes to being a good Jew, he's like, I'm, I'm doing it well. And, and then in verse 7, I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. He, he, he kind of doubles down and reiterates it. Yeah, everything is worthless when compared with the infinite value of, say it with me, knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. That's my question. It's one thing to know that you are known. It's another thing to be hungry, as AJ said. He said, I'm a hungry man. And then he said, I'm a frustrated man. This process has taken me places I didn't think it would. I'm in the middle of some things that I never imagined having to go through, but I'm hungry to know Jesus in everything that I'm going through. Family, are you hungry for Jesus today? 
Are you hungry for the heart of Jesus today? Oh, David, see, David knew. I can't believe it. I can't believe that I get to be known by you. And then God sent Jesus. And Jesus is the way that we close that loop. And we say, I, not only am I known by you, I want to know you through the person of Jesus. I wonder, I wonder, if, is there some things in your life and in my life that we need to count as rubbish, count worthless compared to what it means just to know Jesus. Bill and me and Ed, I think, I don't know if Betsy's here. Baby, why don't you come back down too, if you don't mind. We're going to be up here as prayer partners. Uh, Invitation, not an expectation. The invitation is if you want to talk to somebody, you want to pray with one of us about what it means to know Jesus. It it, it could be as simple as I've been doing this thing for 50 years, but there are some things that I, I need to count as worthless and really double down on knowing Jesus. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Baby, how long has it been since we've been to the Dancing Fox? <laughs> a year, couple years, probably two or three years. Dancing Fox is still awesome. There's no falling out. They're still cool. They're awesome. We just, we just haven't gone in a while. Life. And we moved to North Natomas now. We haven't been there in quite a while. Nothing bad happened. We just drifted. When we get back, it's going to be awesome. I, in fact, I was thinking I want to go back down to the Dancing Fox after this message. Maybe that's Jesus with you. It wasn't a falling out. Maybe you're not a crisis. It's just I remember back when, when, you, when you were moved because Jesus knew you and you knew Jesus. And you're sitting there like, it's, it's been a while since I really took in this relationship that I'm invited into. So maybe there's a drifting away of sorts. No, no falling out, but just, just I really, I really need, need to just... Step back into this relationship to be known by God and to know God through the person of Jesus. I'm going to pray for us, and then the band's going to sing a song that's very applicable to this moment, and we'll be here. You want to know Jesus for the first time? You just want to say, I don't know where I'm at, but I just wanted to respond and ask for prayer. You, you You want to renew your vows with Jesus. All of that can happen before you leave here today. Father, I pray, I pray. For every man, woman in this room today, God, I, I pray that they would even now begin asking the questions, do I know Jesus? I mean, that's what AJ said. He, he said in spite of his resume, he had to ask the question, do I know Jesus? And he said, I'm, I'm a frustrated, hungry man. I don't got all the answers, but I'm hungry to know Jesus. Oh, Holy Spirit, make us hungry to know Jesus. Give us a heart like AJ's to be hungry to know Jesus. Relentlessly, it it matters to us. We we just want to know Jesus. We want to be a church that that's what matters most to us, knowing Jesus. I pray you'd move in the hearts of your people, God, in this moment of invitation, not expectation, whether everyone comes or no one comes, the invitation is, can we pray with you in your journey to know Jesus, that maybe today could be the day where you remind your heart, that you draw a line in the sand that says, I just want to take seriously knowing Jesus. I need to count some things as garbage in my life that I've made really important, but I want, I want that to fall way short of my desire to know Jesus above all things. This is your time. We give it to you. Move in our hearts. Don't let us miss this moment, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's, let's sing. Let's respond.